Okay, I'll go back to mute. Hi, Josh. How are you? Hi, Mary. Hi, Alex. Hi, guys. Hi, good morning. Hi, Yvonne. Here to support the team. Uh, I like your, your thing, David Spade there, Josh. Very nice. You're on mute. I'm on mute. mute. <laughs> there you yeah, are. Everybody always used to th uh, think that I, I look like David Spade for whatever reason. I, I, would <laughs> I would say you're better looking than David Spade, but I get I get where that, you know, could be in there. <laughs> too funny are you guys all working from home now i haven't seen someone on the seawick team in the office in months yeah we've all been we've all been kind of uh doing the, the i guess mobile uh mobile working as you'd call it for a while now yeah um, well I, I i mean i have a new baby too so so that's been part of the the, the factoring of, of that. oh i know i was going to talk about that in today's uh interview because that changes things a little bit it does change things. A lot of it. A lot of it. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's totally true. It's totally true. We usually give people a couple minutes to pop on, so we'll start the official interviewing in a minute or two. I don't know everybody here. I see somebody in a very comfy robe down in the corner. I know. <laughs> It's the beauty of the new world. We can like we can come in our pajamas and robes yeah, in yeah. our car. I love it. I love it. That would I be it, uh, that is Sarah. Say that again. That's Sarah. Uh, uh, Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Oh. Sarah with her oh with her inner cute little puppy. Aww. Uh -huh. That puppy almost doesn't look real. It, that is uh, the most unbelievable dog. <laughs> <laughs> Too funny. And I see PK and Jessica. Which Jessica do we have? Tustado. Oh, hi, Jessica. Hi. Well, I'm actually glad to hear that's how you pronounce your name. I always thought it was Taketa, but it's it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, When I first met my husband, he said it's like Tustado the table. Ah, Tustado ah, the table. Uh, like, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I like it. I think, I think I'll remember that. <laughs> oh my gosh too funny too funny how many brave souls do we usually have for these 9 a.m uh, i know right usually between 9 and 15 i would say you know people pop on depends on how early i can get to them there's john we've got a couple regulars and then uh and then people that kind of come and go so but we record them and i always go back to the handful that i've missed to watch them i miss tiffany hilberts and i make sure i went back and saw that one and Perfect. And a couple of the others so so it's good to have them in our in our bank you know yeah the crazy thing is is like i can't get my um mentees to come to these and i'm like you're crazy like these are the best things that we do because everybody like i want to interview everyone in the company and find out how they got to where they're going and this is pretty much it you know i was gonna say it's probably fun for you to kind of interview people and hear the uh the journeys uh, along the way everybody has such different stories to tell in terms of totally how they landed here and and uh you know the, the the trials and tribulations along the way so totally and how many times have you thought you saw someone that was like super successful and you were like ah how'd they do it yeah right like how'd they do it so this is kind I'll, of our I'll opportunity i'll ask them <laughs> so listen it's 905 and i don't want to waste your time so i think we can get started and let people pop in as they do we got 10 people now um so ready we'll just get started sure awesome um, so I guess first off, we always start with kind of a, give us kind of a little bit of a background and how you got started in real estate. So I was actually an aspiring actor for a while. Okay. Uh, I lived, uh, so I, let me back up. I, I grew up here, went to school at St. John Fisher. Um, I was always, uh, into ath ath uh, athletics, but I, I was also one of those stage kids, which, which sometimes were, uh, conflicting, but. Um, I always had a passion for the arts and I actually took a year off after my junior year in college and moved out to Hollywood for two years. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, pursued acting for a while, um, came back, finished my degree at Fisher, um, still had the acting bug, so I moved to New York City for two years. Okay. Um, and what'd you get your degree in, Josh? Communications uh, with a concentration in, in media studies journalism. Okay, cool. Um, so I, after New York, I moved back to Rochester, that was in uh, 2007. Um, got a cubicle job that literally made me want to strangle myself 
on a daily basis. Um, and I was like, if this is the best that I'm going to be able to do, I may have to just move back to New York and be a starving artist for the rest of my life. I don't know. <laughs> I, don't know I don't know. I don't know what, where, what the answer is here, but this is just not what I want to do. So um, I, I braved that for two years just so that I didn't have that um, that hole on my resume that everybody refers to so commonly. Right. Um, and then acting or, or acting, uh, real estate kind of fell into my lap. Um, one of my best friends, mom was actually an agent on Mark's team. Okay. And she kept saying, Josh, like, I know how miserable you are. You're born to be a salesperson. You have to talk to Mark. You have to talk to Mark. So I met with Mark on literally, I kid you not guys, no less than probably four or five occasions okay. before he convinced me to throw away my $28,000 a year salary that, um, that I hate and the job that I hated to take a shot on a 100% commission uh, job selling real estate. And then once I made the move to do it, this was in 2009. Okay. Um, I got going with him and I literally thought about quitting probably a dozen times um, because it was that hard. Um, you know, and this was also, you got to think about it. This was also right on the heels of one of the worst economic periods that we've had in, you know. Yeah, 2007 was pretty bad. You know, yeah. so the real estate world in Rochester wasn't exactly flourishing. Uh, by any means. And here I am, this newbie agent trying to come in um, when houses aren't exactly easy to sell and getting clients isn't as exactly easy as someone who is unknown and um, doesn't even know how to really put a contract together. So uh, what was Mark's team look like? Like in 2009, like was Mark, see what, what he is today? Was he? We were at Remax Realty Group at the time. Okay. And we, um, we were selling um, I want to say 30 ish million a year, okay. so about half what we're doing now. Okay. Um, same number of agents, but, but business was, was scaled down. I mean, there were no agents on the team at that time doing more than I think five, 5 million a year, maybe. Okay. Um, Mark was doing the lion's share of, of that business. Um, and there were also some, some, some of the agents were part-time um you know people you know doing mommy duties half the time or or 75 percent of the time selling a few houses here and there um we really have three full-time agents now so it's it's uh and, and a larger um support staff a larger right. administrative team Yvonne I don't know if all of you know Yvonne but Yvonne is one of our just um we, we our team cannot function without Yvonne so um, but, but uh, all of them, you know, they all, they all are, are so critical and I don't know of the agents here. I don't know who's on teams and who's, thank uh, anybody. Oh, Jessica. Their own. Okay. So Jessica's the only one on a team. I don't know about Jennifer. Jennifer's okay. not. Jennifer's okay. not. Yeah. So just Jessica. Yeah. So, so it's, you know, it's obviously very different when you're, you know, when you're trying to do it on your own versus, you know, on a team, just, just in terms of the dynamics and in terms of, uh, you know, what roles you have to, what roles you have to take on, what hats you have to wear, um, you know, in trying to sort of be the well-rounded agent. Um, and we can speak to that if you want, as we get into it, but, but yeah, that's sort of the, the, that's sort of the, the synopsis as to how we've, we've landed here. I thought about quitting 12 times. Um, literally I had half a foot out the door um, a couple of times and I was just going to go back to a salary job and be miserable. I had just chalked it up. I'm going to be miserable. I'm going to work in a cubicle and be on Excel all day long. And that's just what it's going to be. And, and then, uh, and then once you, uh, it is probably important. I don't know who's new here, but it, it really is true that if you can just bide your time and get through the first two or three years, um, for some of you, maybe you'll get lucky and it'll be even less than that. But if you can just bide your time and get through those first couple uh, couple years, all of a sudden you start to see um, this explosion happen where you're, you're doing a deal here and you're doing a deal there. And then um, person A refers 
somebody else to you. And, and all of a sudden, the, it just sort of starts to happen and you, and you start to see the affirmation of um, how, how you can sort of build a, a sustaining business. Um, so so I, I would just encourage everybody to, to try to get to that point where you've given it enough of a chance to, to, to sort of see that, that um, compounding effect happen. So Josh, what would you say, um, and the nice thing, you have the benefit, I think one of the things about being on a team is that you had some expert mentorship all along the way, right? You have Mark and he's guiding you and kind of instructing you. So how were you spending those first three years kind of to get this business up and running? What were you doing? So I, I, I guess the first thing I would say to you that, that was really, um, uh, that was really impressed upon me as I was starting is that it's very, very difficult to jump into real estate um, 100% right from the beginning, financially. Um, I know some will say that's the only way to do it. Um, I don't agree with that, um, but everybody's different. I, I, I'm someone who very much needs some semblance of financial stability. Um, the stress of jumping into real estate 100% without really having income coming in in the very beginning would have been it would have made it impossible for me to, to grow and, and to learn and to not feel so pressured on every single deal. You, know, you always hear people talking about the transactional agents versus the agents who are, who are looking at it holistically and trying to build um, a business, always doing right by their clients. Um, I, I would never have been able to get to that point if I was so worried about money coming in that, that all I cared about was putting clients under contract. Um, I, I feel like those are the agents that oftentimes let them let, let themselves fall into situations where they're urging clients to buy houses that they probably shouldn't buy um, or to pay sums of money for houses that probably isn't a smart thing for the client. Um, but I, you know, to, 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 to go back to your question, um, what was I doing in the beginning? Um, so I was working a couple of jobs. I was coaching tennis. Um, I think I was also teaching tennis at the time at, at Midtown Athletic Club. Um, but in terms of real estate, I was just a, a sponge. I was literally putting myself around um, not only Mark, who, who you know, has been selling real estate for 25, 30 years. And, and I knew that I, I, could, I could get from him um, what I needed because I think it's so important to, to not reinvent the wheel. Why, why try to figure it out on your own when you can find people who are doing it and have been doing it for a prolonged period of time and they're doing it well and they're right. succeeding at it. Those are the people to go seek out and, and pick their brain. What are you doing? What have you run into? What works? What doesn't? Um, and I was just trying to sponge anything and everything I could. I was going on appointments with, with Mark. I was listening to how he talked to sellers, how he talked to buyers, learning the, the lingo, the, the verbiage, because you take, the, you take the real estate test, let's face it, like 95% of what you have to study for to pass the test, you, you, you're not using on a daily basis. Um, and that's just the reality of the situation. Yeah. Um, so, it, so knowing that, I knew I had the, the interpersonal skills. I knew I was a people person. I knew that part of it was going to come easily for me. Right. What wasn't going to come easily for me was being able to stand my ground in front of a client, knowing that I knew what I was talking about. Right. And that's so important to be able to, to come off to someone like, you know, what you're talking about, you know, your craft, you know, you know this, this is the biggest purchase anybody's going to make in their lifetime. Most times that I, I knew coming in, they were not going to trust me. They were not going to want to work with me unless I knew what the hell I was talking about right. and could come off as such. Right. So I, I just made it my mission to become that person as fast as possible. That's awesome. And you know, it's funny because you're the expert, the first person in all the interviews we've done that prioritize the learning to make sure that you were excellent at your craft, right? First, before you kind of really then spread out to the world. We're all, we spend so much time talking about lead gen because I think that's in some ways one of the hardest parts of the business, you know, but, but we really shouldn't minimize being excellent at what we do, because if you are, then that next sale is more likely to turn into another sale instead of like, Oh, I got it. I mean, going back to what I said, I think, I think having another job, having a source of income when I was starting allowed me to 
be methodical and to prioritize how to how to start the right way. Right. Because I, I think a lot of us, you know, talk about agents who have now been doing it five, 10 years, and they never really learned how to do it the right way at the beginning. You know, right. they don't they don't even have good practices now, 10 years into the business. And it's not just lead generation. I mean, you know, that is a huge thing and and is not, you know, it shouldn't go un, unspoken about, but but what good is lead generation if you don't know what the hell you're doing? Right. You know, I, I mean, it, and how it's it's 10 times more difficult to lead generate if you don't know what you're doing. Right. Well, I, 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 I always looked at it like that, but I'm also the kind of person that wants to be great at everything I'm doing. And right. that's sometimes a fault for me because it, it puts me into this paralysis by analysis situation a lot of times. Um, it's hard for me to move forward with something if I don't know that I'm doing it the right way. Right. Okay. Um, and I and I can get stuck doing that. So I, I would caution people to not not just get not just get stuck until until you're you know perfect at something. But I think that there's a, a really important happy medium there in terms of knowing enough of what you're doing, knowing enough to be able to speak confidently mm -hmm. um, and not have to lie about stuff. Um, that that you can kind of start to move forward with clients and have those conversations when you're at a showing about. Right you know, what, what needs, what needs to be called out about a house, you know, defects and, and traits that, that justify a price perhaps. Um, okay. Before you jump to the next question, one other thing, I know I'm probably jumping off on some tangents here, but there's a bunch of things kind of flooding back to my mind from when I was first starting. Um, it's so important not to lie, you guys. Never answer a question that you don't know the answer to just because you want to come off like you know what you're talking about. Because if they catch you in, in, the, in a lie, it will bite you. You're probably going to lose the client and your name is, your, your name is everything. And it's a, Rochester is a small town. You do not want to be branded as the agent who misleads or lies or uh, doesn't do right by clients. Um, always, it's always a better answer to say, you know what, I, I, that's a really good question. I don't know the answer to that, but let me find out for you. Right. Right. Way rather you answer a question that way. Um, and it's hard when you're a new agent, you want to come off knowing everything. So, so sometimes it's very easy to say, uh, and just, and just throw an answer out there, um, that may or may not be the right answer. Um, so I, I learned that lesson a couple of times actually the hard way because I, I wanted to come off knowing what I was doing. And right. it was such a big deal to me to, to, to do that, that I, I tried to fudge some answers right. and it, it was not the right decision. Well, that's good to admit, right? You yeah. know what I run into a lot of times is this like prioritizing, like advocating for your client versus like being like, a good bestie agent. I had like an example and I don't know where you fall with this, but you know, I had, uh, we, you know, we had kind of verbally negotiated a price plus concessions and then the agent submitted it to me. And all of a sudden I realized he'd done it wrong. Like he actually got his client less money because he like took the money we agreed upon and then added 6%. Well, when you take 6% off of that, it wasn't 280 anymore. It was actually less. And I was like, like is it my responsibility to tell him that he's you know, gotten his clients less money or not. And I find myself running into those situations all the time. I don't know how you feel about that. If you prioritize like the agent relationship or the client relationship, or it's just, you know. You know your, your client always has to come first, in my opinion. Your, your fiduciary obligation is, is to the client you're representing. So, uh, you know, that said though, uh, your, your, your relationship with your colleagues meaning the other agents that you're probably going to work with several times over, over the course of your career, if you, if you stay in this, this game long enough, um, will really be important um, in the long run. I've, I've won bidding wars because of my relationship with agents. Right. Um, so so I, I, I would very much impress upon um, you know, the new agents here, especially that the more you can you know, if you want to call it befriending, um, I guess I'll use that term for lack of a better one. But if you if building rapports with the agents, especially the agents who are listing a lot of inventory, <laughs> is is a smart decision. Right. Well, and just coming at it from a collaborative, right? I mean, some people come at it so adversarial, like they're not doing their job if they're not like yelling at you all. It's, a it's, it's let's face it. I, I mean, it, it, we're in a competitive business. Um, 
you know, you got in any given year, you have 2,500 to 3,000 licensed agents in the, you know, the Rochester area. You know, I think that includes the surrounding counties, but the, in the GRAR, I guess. Right, right. Um, that's a lot of agents, you know, competing for business. Now, there is plenty of business out there, um, you know, for those agents to do. But yeah, I, I think that it, it can sometimes feel really adversarial. Um, and, 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 you know, I guess to some degree that, that there's no way around that. But I, I think there's a lot of agents doing really good business who are very friendly and very personable and, you know, would jump to, to help new agents or any agents, really. I, there's a lot of agents I've sought out now 10 years in. Um, you know, I'll call Steve Robel or I'll call you know, another agent that I do business with a lot that I love, that I like, and just have a good relationship with just to ask, Hey, have you ever been in this situation? You know, what do you think? What would you do? Yeah, uh, for sure, for sure. And I think there's a lot of that. So I, I would absolutely encourage agents out there to pick up the phone, text somebody, shoot an email, like, Hey, you know, I, I'm stuck. What, what do you think I can do in this situation? Or like the Keller, Keller Williams Facebook um, group is great for that. You know, you, you, you see that all the time. I think the the evolution of, of that, that group uh, and, and, and what people are using it for has been fantastic. From, from questions about a contract to uh, does they have a plumber or an electrician or you know, somebody that, that they can recommend. I, my client needs you know, X, Y, or Z. Um, I, there's so many uh, resources out there to, to utilize for, for those kinds of things. Yep. So somebody put in the chat box, they were wondering how long did it take you to get your first sale? Um, let's see. I want to say, I could be wrong, but inside my first six months, you know, probably four or five months, I want to say. Okay. And uh, Josh, as a buyer's agent, how much of your business, especially in the beginning, was kind of, I'd say, given to you by Mark, and how much are you expected to drive on your own? Because I you know a lot of people who might want to be a buyer's agent don't really know where that falls, you know? So when I was first starting, um, I mean, I was doing all, 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 all of the business I was doing was representing buyers, first of all. So that Mark had found and was passing to you or that you were expected to find on your own? Um, I don't know if there was an expectation so much in the beginning in terms of, you know, quote unquote, what percentage of business I would bring to the table versus what Mark would give me. Mm -hmm. um, at that point, it was still just, you know, learn what you're, you know, try to figure out what you're doing kind of thing. And then, you know, if and when I'm, I feel, I think if and when Mark felt confident that I could handle someone, it was almost like a everything was a test run at that point. Right, right. Um, and and I, 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 you know, I, I was given clients, but I think I even still had help at that point. Um, you know, it was like start showing these guys houses. Um, if and when they're ready to write a contract, let's bring another agent in with you, so you get. Okay. You know, it was kind of like learning right. um, to walk before I could run, kind of thing. Um, you know, I think I did um, maybe a million my first year, or just under a million um, in business. And I, you know, that was probably, I don't know, four deals or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I wouldn't say I really started to, to actively get my own business, um, until the end of my second year okay. it was starting here and there, like little by little, you know, a friend would call or, um, you know, somebody in my family would refer somebody um, but again, I, you know, I'll hearken back to what I said before, it's hard to get people to refer you business until they feel like, you know, what you're doing, right? Because, because their name that, you know, their, their reputation to some degree is, is on the line too. If a family member refers a really good friend of theirs to you and you F it up for lack of a better way of putting it, you know, and that's going to reflect really poorly on them too. So, and I knew that, I knew that going in, I knew that you know, as much as we want to ask for, you know, people to, you know, send me anybody, send me business. Like I'm a real estate agent now. Like I, I can't, I couldn't really do that in good faith without knowing that I knew my craft. Right. Because so it was how did everything. you end up doing that? Like, it's funny because I you're obviously learning and being excellent at what you do is important, but then there is the getting the business part. And so as a buyer's agent, it's a little different for you than a solo agent, right? Because you started with at least some business you got to learn, you know, um, did you then ever like, well, one, how long did it take you to quit your job, quit your day job? I quit it. 
Uh, Mark said you have two weeks to quit, and I I I just did it. I just quit. I mean, how long into the business was that? Like as soon as you joined this week? That was before I ever even that came over. I oh packed, really? So you did quit up, your job? Oh, okay. I packed up my office at this okay. nine to five, and I was at R Remax sitting in a desk chair the next day, wondering what the hell I was gonna do. And okay. Well, how did you spend those days then? How were you spending those first two years? How what was your days looking like? And what do your days look like now? So first two years, I, uh, like I said, I was um, I was following. Um, I, I was listening to Mark on phone calls. I was listening to the other agents on the team on phone calls. I was trying to pick up what does real estate talk sound like? Okay. What do conversations about houses sound like? What do conversations about the market that we're in sound like? Okay. Um, what do conversations around okay, we found a house, we're ready to write a contract, look like. Um, I wanted to learn every anything and everything I could about the holistic art of selling real estate. And okay. I think it's an art. I, I really do think that selling real estate is an art. I think that putting contracts together, especially nowadays, um, <laughs> requires the imagination um, that I, an imagination that I never would have expected. Um, you know, I mean, I, some of us remember the days when you actually can negotiate contracts, you know, now, we're, now it's like, figure out a way to submit the greatest offer of all time, and then pray that, that, you know, your client is prevailing amongst 10, 15, 20 other offers, and try not to worry and sweat too much about how much they might be overpaying. You know, I, what you're having to think about now is so different from what I was having to think about when I started 10 years ago. I mean, talk about different markets. Oh, yeah. Like coming in on the heels of, of a recession versus now. It's like the, the new agents now it, it just it couldn't even comprehend what things were like in 2009, 2010. But, uh, you know, what was I doing? I was, I was just sponging. I, I was trying to learn everything and anything and everything I could. When agents were writing contracts with a buyer, whether on my team or not, um, I told the other agents in the Remax office at the time too, uh, you know, if you're willing, I would love to sit with you when you're writing a contract with a client, just to see what it, to see how it works. Mm -hmm. um, if anybody's willing to allow me to come on showings with them um, or hold open houses with them, um, not just hold open houses on my own, which I was willing to do too, right. but, but I'd love to hold an open house with you, um, especially the agents that I knew were good at picking up buyers at open houses. Right. I mean, I really, I really informed myself. Right. With, was who were the prominent agents? What were they good at? What were they not good at? Um, so that I could try to pick off the best practices from everyone around me. Okay. Um, and and I then how about today, now that you're way deeper into it, like what, and, and it's so different for you, right? Like so many individual agents have all these hats they have to wear, right? Mm -hmm. And you're like, how do you prioritize that time? Do I spend it trying to get my website up and running? Do I spend it trying to create marketing collaterals? You have a lot of that done for you. So mm -hmm. How do you spend your day? What's what's a day in the life look like from a work standpoint? This year? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? I'd say last year. Like, let's talk about like back to normal. Life. All right, all right. Yeah. Uh, last year, day in the life. Um, you know, I'm still representing probably 75, 25 buyers to sellers. Yep. Right now. Um, and that, I, that has graduated to that point over the 10 years or so I've been in business. So it's always been far more pronounced buyers than sellers. And I, it's, been a, it's been a goal to try to get more seller business. Um, buyer, representing buyers is, in my opinion, is the most time consuming side of selling real estate. Um, some people prefer buyers, some, some people prefer sellers, some people don't care. Um, they, they like to try to get to an equilibrium of both. Um, so, so given the fact that, that it's mostly buyers that I'm working with, um, most days honestly are just a lot of running around with, with buyers showing houses. Um, um, I, I, I hate the administrative side of selling real estate. So <laughs> it sounds like, yes, you too. I, I, I can't stand it. Yeah, Yvonne, Yvonne of all people knows how I'm constantly asking for help with stuff because I just, I, I know that about myself. I know that I, because I hate it, I'm not good at it. Um, so I, I admittedly try as hard as I can to stay away from the administrative side of real estate. 
but it's still it's, it's still crucially important. So if you do, if you're not fortunate like I am to have um, someone like Yvonne who who does all of the contract piece of it, and you know we have a listing coordinator who is able to pick up a lot of that administrative functionality of 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 what it is to input a listing into the system and and get it live. Um, you know you have to prioritize prioritize those things. But I think it's just um, it's finding a balance so that you can get everything done. Everything done. Um, and, and for me at this point, it's, it's mostly showing houses, getting, trying to get people under contract, um, and, and then kind of handing them off to the people I have at, at my disposal who are really good at what they do, whether it's contract administration or it's, um, uh, you know, following up with attorneys or mortgage brokers or whatever the case might be. When you're a solo agent, um, I think that you have to, you have to build slowly. You have to you you have to walk before you run. So, to me, it and in the beginning for us, it was even being on the team. It was the same thing. I didn't have somebody administering my contracts until I was selling probably seven eight million dollars a year. So you know, I, it was the same for me even back on the team. I was doing my own contract administration and um, you know and selling, and I had to balance the two. So a lot of times for me, it was okay during the day or right after work when people want to look at houses, I'm going to make myself available to show houses. And then I'm going to know that on the off times when I'm not showing houses or later in the evening, that's when I'll do my contract administration. Right. And, um, now you have to work when other people are working too. So, you know, if I knew that some of my contract in administration was following up with attorneys because attorney approvals are due, or following up with mortgage brokers because I know I know that my buyer's mortgage commitment is due in two days. Um, I got to do that during the day, you know, when when I know people are working. Right. Um, you know, so it's it's carving out time in your in your calendar um, to do those things, and you know, and then oh, let's not forget, you know, the hour or two you're spending on trying to lead generate with your sphere. And that was my question. So, do you have lead? Do you have to lead gen? And if you do, like, how much time a day do you spend towards that? And how do you do it? So, I'm not. I'm admittedly not good at specifically like carving out an hour a day or something to do lead generation. Um, we, we, our team, I think, does lead generation a bit differently um, than perhaps some other agents do, or I, you know, I guess I won't even speak for my team. I'll just speak for myself. Yeah. Well, and that's what this is all about, right? We, we do a lot of, um, a lot of events around right. fear stuff. Um, a lot of my lead generation at this point, and uh, you know, I really preface that by saying at this point, because you can't do this. <laughs> um, I I'm taking clients out to dinner a lot or, you know, pre COVID Every, everything I'm saying is pre COVID right. I'm taking clients out to dinner, out to drinks, almost every night, um, okay. if not every night, you know, certainly three, four times a week. We're doing client events at least once a quarter um, where it's, you know, like this year, we just had everybody come to get a pumpkin at Mark's house. Right. And it just gives us a chance to catch up with people we haven't talked to in a while. Um, do you, you find know, the response to be good on that? Like, I think a lot of times people want to do those things, but they're afraid because they're like, what if nobody shows? So just kind of like to give people confidence to do it. People respond to that sort of thing, right? People love interaction. P people love um, the human interaction piece. I I've always found that to be the, the, the easiest and the greatest lead generation source um, because I'm a people person. So I I'd rather be at dinner with a group of clients that just closed in the last two months right. or at a client event with people I'm hoping might be clients down the road, whether it's a pumpkin event for Halloween or a haunted hayride, or it's, you know, a Christmas party, or it's, um, I don't know what other things we've done. Um, I'm trying to think, uh, because you can do things individually too. You don't have to be on a team to do a client event where you're inviting everybody at one time. Yeah. Um, you know, a Red Wings game, you know, people do, or um, um, I'm trying to think what other things we've done. I don't know, Yvonne, Yvonne, maybe you can weigh in on some other client event things we've done. You know, we've, it doesn't have to be a big thing either. Sometimes it's just having a bunch of people over to, to somebody's house. And, and ice cream we did too, that was smaller. Yeah, like ice cream social kind of things. Like it doesn't have to be an expensive, elaborate thing. I think people get in their head about Oh, you know, I gotta, I gotta, if I'm going to put on an event, I got to put on this event that's regal and that, you know, that seems like it's over the top to make people want to come. 
I actually think it's the opposite sometimes. Right. People want to do events where they can bring their kids and they can, you know, it's it's fun for the whole family. And it's, you know, it, it's it's the, the drinks thing works too. But but if you're always doing dinner and drinks, the people are going to feel like they can't bring their kids and then they got to find a babysitter right. and that makes it harder for them to come. Um, I think um, you that leads back to you having a baby. So yeah, I have a new dad, dad, Josh. That he yeah. is, well, I remember pre-COVID, Mark said one time to me that he and Duffy figured that they went out to dinner or something crazy, like 27 of 30 days in a month, every month. I mean, something crazy like that, right? And it sounds like you were, yeah, Mark did that. Um, Mark. Sounds like you were the same, right? Uh, you know, I, I have never been to the degree that Mark has, but, right. but yeah, I mean, I, but like three to four nights a week is a lot. Pre, pre fatherhood. Um, I was going out a lot I was, <laughs> I was going out for drinks, um, <laughs> dinners and, and now, you know, and now as a daddy, you know, you're, you don't want to go out anymore. You want to be home all the time. And right. Uh, so it is interesting because I thought about that. Like there is no way, like there is no way I can go out to dinner four nights a week. Like I just couldn't, I feel like a terrible parent at that point. So we're at different life stages, right? My kids will be gone in seven years and maybe that'll be different. So have you thought about how you're going to supplement that for something else now? I, I told Mark, heading into this that I, the days of me going out with him all the time uh, to host clients were probably quickly coming to an end um, to which he sort of yawned and said okay we'll see uh, <laughs> but but uh, yeah I, I'm not going to be going to dinners you know three four nights a week um, certainly and luckily COVID has given you a really good excuse so COVID that's <laughs> made it easy for sure you know it's been a really hard time to for all of us for a myriad of reasons but a hard time to to you know, watch a pregnant wife go through it, and and then to have a, a child in the middle of, of this insanity has been you know certainly been difficult. But it, it, there's been some nice silver linings about it too. I, you know, I mean, being home, I'm home all the time now. Right. You know, I work from home. I I I, I do all of my 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 calls at home. Um, so it's been nice in that regard. But um, yeah, I mean, what will lead generation look like next year, the year after? Um, I don't know. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm constantly thinking about, you know, how do I balance making calls, you know, shooting people emails, um, even texting people on their birthdays. And, you know, there's, there's so many things you can do that, that aren't incredibly time consuming. Right. Um, a personal note, a little personal note to someone on their birthday, get a card, a blank card, get everybody's birthdays in your calendar from Facebook. And just send a little a little note to them on their birthday. Um, you know, ha, you know, happy birthday. Um, you know, hope you have a great day, great year. That goes such a long way. It seems like such a stupid, like trivial thing, but that extra mile, as opposed to just wishing them happy birthday on their Facebook page, which we all can do, and that's that's great. But just going that little extra mile on things to to write a little note to someone on their birthday, or you see that they just celebrated their anniversary, or um, somebody just changed, you saw on LinkedIn, somebody just, um, changed jobs and, and got promoted or, you know, anything like that, any kind of, somebody just had a baby or got married or, you know, whatever, send a little thing of flowers, um, send a card, send a note, all of those things. Those are the generation. Yeah. Those Although it's interesting because those are like the daily activities that long-term will bring you business. And I think it's hard when you're new because you want business now. Right. And so you have to do both. It's both. And you got to do that stuff, which you're like, I hope it's like you're throwing goodwill into the universe and you're just hoping that eventually it's going to come back to you. And then there's the like, okay, well, what do I do right now? Because like, I have a coach and the coach is like, all right, you need to have four listing appointments next week. And I was like, how do I get four listing appointments next week? So do you guys ever run into that? Do you brainstorm those things? We're like, we need business like yesterday. So how do we do that? Um, you know, I, we're always trying to, to grow, right? All of us. We're always trying. No matter where we're at in the state, in in the in the process, we're always trying to do more. Um, until you get to a point where you're like, "Oh my God, I don't know if I can do anymore." <laughs> um, and what a great problem to have if you get to that point. But um, you know, the answer to your question is yes. Um, you know, we're so always. What are those things? What are you doing if you're like when Mark's like, "Listen, guys, we are down. We need business next week. What are we gonna do?" Um, I, I hate cold calling. So I will not cold call. Um, I just won't do it. It, it, it just, it, it, it's, a, I know that it's necessary. Um, fortunately, I'm in a position where I, I can do enough business without doing it. 
Um, that may not be a smart long-term um, stance to take. Um, um, I'm of the mind that because I hate it so much and I feel like there's other ways that I can build my business um, and have been able to build my business, I, I just focus on those things. So what are those things? Uh, because I might as well talk about what I do, what I do personally find success with as opposed to, to what I don't, right. um, especially as a new person. You have to get out there any way in every way that you can that you're a real estate agent. You have to let your sphere know and those that aren't in your sphere directly, your Facebook, because I consider your, your group of Facebook friends or whoever you're associated with on Instagram, or if you're on Twitter, or you know, let's face it, all the social media vehicles are, are, are red meat for your ability to get out to the world um, that you sell real estate now and right. that you're succeeding as you're succeeding. So you put a deal together, that better be all over Facebook. That better, you better be, you better be plastering that on Instagram. Just did my first deal. Here's a picture of my clients with their soul sign in the front, in the front yard. Right. You need to brand yourself as a real estate agent who is selling real estate. So in the beginning, agents will say, well, I haven't sold anything yet. Just get out there that, that you're in real estate. Right. And then now people are getting the idea that you're selling real estate. Hey, I went to this class. I just learned this today. I, you know, start to talk about things that, you know, that, that, that can make it look like, you know, um, you know, I, I just had a discussion with an agent about the state of the market, make notes and put all that stuff on Facebook. Hey guys, here's what's going on in, in the real estate world. Um, you know, bidding wars are crazy and houses are selling 30,000 over asking price. And, you know, people are using escalation clauses and here's how the more stuff you can put out there that makes it look like, you know, what you're doing, you're going to start to get people coming in because they know you're selling real estate and they, they, it starts to look like, you know, what you're doing. Right. Um, and then as you're selling, put that out there. Don't become someone whose Facebook page is all real estate, unless it's a business page, but a good, a good, it's so important to have a good mix of who are you as a person? What are you doing? What's your family life look like? What's your friends look like? And then mix that in with real estate, right. sprinkle it in here and there and everywhere. Right. So that people can, can see who you are. This, this person looks like a really trustworthy person. Look at their dog, look at their kids. They got a really, really nice family life. They look trustworthy. And oh, by the way, it's very clear they're selling real estate and they're doing a good job at it. They know what they're talking about. They talk about the state of the market. They, they show pictures of, of clients having, having bought a house so I can see they're doing it. Um, pick off, go on, um, go on on the real estate sites that have really cool articles um um oh god i'm trying to think of the name of the um uh, Life is real estate there's market something oh my gosh I'm, I'm blanking on the name of there's a really cool yes all of those that you just mentioned there's a really cool um, website. I can't think of it. Maybe Yvonne will think of it. We post a lot of articles um, that are more like fun articles. Like, um, you know, Alex Rodriguez just bought a $30 million house in, you know, in Florida, you know, check out the pictures. Um, I'll, I'll text you, Mary, and maybe you can get it out to everybody who yeah. on the, the call. I'm just blanking on the name. It's, 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 it's an interesting it's an interesting real estate place just for you to go to yeah, yeah. Just kind of hear, you know, fun stories. I'll, I'll post them on my website all the time. I just posted one. Um, Derek Jeter has this house up for sale um, in, you know, somewhere in Florida. I can't remember. Right, right. Uh, okay. But fun stories like that too. You're, you're, it's just all about engaging people, you know, in, in anything and everything real estate. And it doesn't always have to be local. Sometimes it's, you know, what's going on nationally. Um, you know, what kind of fun things are happening, trend stuff, yeah. um, you know, Pottery Barn, what's the latest, what's the hottest color this year? Um, you know, all of those kinds of things that, that people are, and you'll have, you'll actually have more success. I found getting people to engage on the stuff that's personal to them or that they're interested in, meaning design styles, um, colors, um, those kinds of things that are re really relatable as opposed to just, please give me business. Like, look what I sold. Like, look how much I'm selling. People don't really care how much business you do. They really don't. Like, it's great to be able to say, I've been in real estate for 10 years or 20 years and I'm selling, you know, tens of millions of dollars or whatever. 
Um, and you'll get there. You'll get there. I know it doesn't feel like it all the time, but you'll get there if you if you stick with it and you and you really bust your butt and and do all of these these things we're talking about. But you don't have to get there to get business. People just want to. People just want somebody that they can that they can relate to, they can trust, and that knows what they're doing and that cares about them. Right. At the end of the day, if you show somebody that you care and it comes across, you that will be a client for life. So let's get back to that because I'm always curious what people's um, nurture plan is after the sale, right? Do you have specific things that you do or do you have a gift that you buy or a certain level of gift that you buy? And what's the follow-up plan for referrals and for- We're always doing, sort of I always do a client gift for everybody when they close. Is that something you come up with or is that the office kind of does that I for come up with I, I come up with gift because I nobody knows the clients better than I do. I worked okay. with them for, okay. you know, for several months. So- um, I'm always, I always give a client gift and usually that the amount of the gift is going to be, um, correlated with, you know, what they just bought or sold. Sure. Um, you know, so somebody who buys or sells a $500,000 house is not going to get the same gift as someone who buys an $80,000 house, okay. you know, or a hundred thousand dollar house. Um, but I, I try to make the gifts personalized. You know, if I know somebody's into golf, you know, maybe I'll get them something related to golf. If I know somebody is really into, you know, uh, what they're going to, what, how they're going to stylize their new house. Um, a Pottery Barn gift card is a great gift card um, or getting them something from Pottery Barn. If I know they're a cook um, or really like to be in the kitchen, maybe I'll get some, get them something from William Sonoma. Um, you so know, I, it's a little bit different. You're just like kind of. Yeah, I think the more personalized you can make a gift, the better. Um, you know, the more it's going to be, it's, it's going to come across as being heartfelt. You didn't just go to Wegmans and get them a gift card to you know, to Dunkin' Donuts, you know, you, you got them something that, and for a coffee drinker, maybe that's a great gift. I don't know, right, but right. you know, you get them something that, that is personal to them. Right. Um, and I'll take clients out to dinner a lot. Um, there's nothing more personal than that to me. Right. Um, I, to me, it's all about building that rapport um, and maintaining that rapport. So, yeah. so it, you know, it's a gift afterwards. Um, a lot of times we'll, we'll order them pizzas as they're moving in. Right. Um, it seems like a, a really simple thing, um, but hey, um, hey Joe, like you know, I know you're closing on Tuesday. You know, when are you guys moving? Well, I'm, we're moving in next weekend. All right, I'd love to send a pizza over. Um, you know, let me know uh, what time would be good, what day and time would be good. Saturday at five would be great, Josh. Like we're gonna be moving, the truck will be there. We're gonna be moving all of our stuff in. You know, that's like such an easy, simple thing to do. Um, and you know, it, it's so meaningful to clients. A ten dollar thing like that. And they will remember forever that you sent them a pizza while they were moving in. Right. Um, how about for referrals and stuff? I've read, I've been reading Perk Your Sphere about how important, like, um, kind of thanking the gift that you want, right? You want referrals. Do you guys, do you have any process for that as far as what you do for people who've referred you business? Um, you know, we, we always get referral sources a gift when the client closes also. Okay. Um, you know, and oftentimes that's a bottle of wine or it's, um, you know. It, it could be anything, what, you know, whatever, again, whatever is, is, is suited, but, um, you know, the, the, it's usually events. It's usually yeah. taking people out to, to dinners, to drinks. Um, certainly all of our client we do, we always try to at least a one quarterly client event. So you're, you're getting touch points and right. we, our, our team kind of likes to, 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 when we can err on the side of doing things in person versus doing things you know, behind a computer screen or behind a telephone, not to minimize the importance of those things, but I, the, the, the in-person touches, I think have far more um, meaning and longevity yep. than the non-person touches. So the more you can make your touches personal, uh, meaning in-person, in my opinion, right. um, the, the more um, impactful that is. How has that changed for you and the team, I guess, in COVID? You know, we've had to we've had to resort to the, the phone. Um, right. You know, we've had to resort to shooting emails out, texting people. Um, you know, everything for everybody now is is so much more. You know, everybody feels so much more distance now. So much more um, that it, that interpersonal connection for all of us on so many levels has been just robbed away. Talk yeah. about. Talk about bringing to light how how important that is for all of us and how meaningful that is, not just in our business, but just just as human beings in the day to day. Um, I, I I can tell you, I am I am missing contact with people 
um, like crazy. Yeah. Uh, and I know clients are too. I mean, they, they like it. They, they like to get together. They like to have dinner and drinks and, um, you know, get together for a happy hour or, or a client event or whatever. But, you know, all we can do is work with what we got. Yep. And, um, you know, right now it's, it's being safe. It's, right. it's not, it's, it's not putting people in harm's way. So, you know, it, and it's also cheap to, to get on the phone with people, pick up the phone, um, you know, congratulate somebody on a closing, um, or, Hey, I haven't talked to you in a couple months. Um, you know, just wanted to touch base, see how things are going. Um, I know it's a really hard time, you know, uh, you know, I hope you're doing well. I'm here if, if, you know, if you need anything real estate or otherwise, um, don't always feel like you need a reason to call. That's the other thing. Um, I, and I think it's so easy to, I it's still 10 years in there's times where I'm like, Oh God, like what can I come up with as a reason to call them? You don't need a reason. Why do you need a reason to call? It does, and it doesn't need to be oftentimes calling without a reason or without <laughs> real estate related is, is really meaningful because it, 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 it comes across authentic. It comes across like, Hey, you know, I just want to catch up and see how you're doing. We haven't spoken in a while. Um, and maybe real estate doesn't even come up on the call. Um, you know, I, they know you're in real estate. They know who you are. Um, just touching base sometimes is enough. This is an interesting question just from a system standpoint, because uh, from the follow-up standpoint, and maybe Yvonne, this is a better question for you, but um, is there a system in place? Like what's your the system you use CRM as far as to be like, oh, like make sure you call them a week after to see how things are going. Or do you have those types of like things in place? And if so, what is the system that you use if you're willing to share? I, I don't know, Yvonne, do you want to weigh in on-, on Do you want me, you want me to go? <laughs> Somebody. <laughs> I mean, we use, we use property base, okay. <laughs> property base is our main CRM. Um, and that kind of just guides us through the whole transaction process. Okay. Um, and so far as communication, I know the, like Josh has his own communication schedule and then Mark checks in with me periodically throughout transactions of like when to contact people. Okay. Do you do things like, Hey Mark, like, or Hey Josh, you know, you closed two weeks ago. Did you call that guy up and make sure that everything was fine? I mean, do you, do you kind of like mother your mother your agents and say, hey, no. did you follow up with them? No. <laughs> He's a mother friend. He's a mother <laughs> friend. Not in that regard, but she she definitely mothers us in, a, in plenty of other ways. <laughs> in plenty of other ways. I think we all I think we all have our own systems. Yeah. Um, and, and all of you will have your own systems. Um, your system doesn't need to look exactly like anybody else's. Um, it probably it won't necessarily. No. Uh, but it's good to see what other people do. Come up with what works for you um but do something um you know for some people it's just having an excel spreadsheet um that they're keeping track of um who do i need to who do i need to to call and when and, and check it off when you've done it. um for some people it's using something like property base and having a really automized um you know way of doing it where you're getting you know notifications electronically or something yeah. um you know whatever works but it's 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 very important to to touch base with people um, as much as you can, just, just to, to, see, to see how closing went, if, if that's the situation, um, or, or just, um, you know, even if somebody isn't in a, a, a real estate transaction at the moment, um, you know, you're, you're a friend, you're a family member, you're, a, you're, a, you're someone I hope to get business from. I don't need to say that overtly to you, but right. that's enough reason to, to just call and check in with you to see how things are going. Right. Um, yeah, absolutely. We have a couple of questions popping up on the chat, so I'm going to go through them. So one was, uh, what is your personal volume this year, I guess, or last year, ever? Here, I will. I think that I will close. Um, I gotta. I have to look actually. Um, I've been so busy. I I haven't even. But I think I'll probably close eleven and a half or twelve million, something like that. Yep. Okay. Um, do you feel like being on a well-known team helped you grow your business, or do you feel like you can credit your or do you feel like it was all you, Josh? You can credit yourself more to your own personal branding and advertising. Yeah, I can't credit my. I can't. I can't. I wish I could credit myself, but the, um, I, I can't credit myself. Um, I, I think that. Um, I think that the association of being with someone who um, who had already done the branding um, was huge in the beginning. Okay. And obviously, I mean, you've been on a team for 10 years and continue to stay on the team. So you feel the value of what that brings, right? I mean, we haven't even talked about what you feel the benefits of being on a team are, but do you want to talk about that a little? Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, 
one of the benefits of sitting right here, uh, you know, on the call, um, <laughs> having help, having support um, is, is enormous. Um, selling real estate is hard. It's, it's really hard. It, it, it looks all glitzy and glamorous on, on Bravo and on HGTV with millions of listing <laughs> and these shows. Um, you know, and there's, a, there's some ways in which it, it, it can be, and it can be very lucrative and, you know, the sky's the limit, but, but having support is, is hard. Um, we were just, we've been talking all year, but as recently as a day or two ago, there's just not enough time in the day to get everything, to do everything. So I, I literally couldn't sell the amount of business I'm, I'm selling right now if I, if I didn't have the support. So if, if I wasn't on a team and I was trying to sell this much business, I would have to start creating my own. Right. Um, you know, and, and in the beginning, that would mean my own set of support staff and then probably building agents around me, which right. some agents go that route. Um, and I don't know, you know, I don't know what the future holds. I don't, I don't know if that might be an avenue I might go down um, at some point. But for the time being, um, there's such a camaraderie established with, with our team and everyone on it that... You know, that in and of itself makes it hard to, you know, to, to entertain the thought of kind of going off and, and, and doing my own thing. Um, but the support from, from Dana on the listing end of things and, and Yvonne on the, the, the contract side of things. Um, and Marissa, uh, you know, helps with um, just so much back end stuff that I'm probably not even aware of, but social media and everything that's property based, which is the, the um, kind of our data center, if you will. Um, that, that just, that, that frees me up to do what I like to do, which is to be with clients, to be out, um, you know, showing people houses and listing houses. And, uh, you know, I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to sell real estate. I don't want to do the administrative piece of it. And I, yeah. and being on a team affords me that luxury to be able to focus on what I'm good at. It's, yeah. it's, it's, I, I always, I always make the doctor analogy. The doctor isn't the one who, who brings you into the room and does your initial consult, that's, that's the nurse or the, you know, or the support person. Everybody has their, their role. And on a team, it, you really can see it. It's really defined. As a solo agent, you're, you have to be a jack of all trades. You have to, you know, you have to be, you have to make yourself at least proficient at doing everything. And then, you know, maybe you're really good at doing one or two things, but I haven't found many agents who are great at every piece of the real estate puzzle. Yeah. Uh -huh. I feel like that's where I am in my business. It's like, I'm starting to be like, I'm not great at that. I'm not doing it. So I need help. Right. So, and then you start to build some support yeah. help, right? Because you can't do it all or you can, and you have to stay within a smaller bubble or drive yourself crazy. So, so that's cool that you <laughs> value, you know, the support, you know, and, and what that does, it lets you be what you're good at, which yeah. is fantastic, you know, um, speaking of how much you love clients, uh, Jonathan said, do you take all your clients out to dinner or just your top clients? How do you determine who gets that level of like personal care? Um, <laughs> um, I'll give you a truthful answer, although it's probably not going to sound great. <laughs> um, I, I take all of the clients that I like out to dinner. Right. Um, because if I can't, if it's hard for me to stomach a showing with them, sitting for dinner with them for an hour and a half or two hours would make me want to kill myself. <laughs> so those clients that I don't necessarily want to hang out with for two hours, um, right. they get a gift that doesn't require me to be with them for two hours. Right, right. Um, so a lot of times, but it's a good question. Um, it's, it's, it, it's back to that question of how do, you, how do you decide what gift you're getting and how do you prioritize um, you know, who you're doing what for? Right. Um, you know, I, li I like to spend time with the people that I like. Um, and, and fortunately at this point um, in my career, it wasn't like this always, most of my, the great majority of the people I'm working with, I enjoy their time. I, I enjoy spending time with them, but I'm able to pick and choose who I'm working with. There's, there's people who come across my desk, so to speak, during the course of a year that I say no to. Um, or or I, don't, I don't say no, I say that th they will, they, they're probably better off working with somebody else because I don't have time. You're like or, Crandall can take them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll saddle a little Crandall with them. Um, you know, but but to me, that's that's not only is that a privilege at that at th this point, but it's also doing right by them. Right. Um, because even though I don't necessarily want to spend my time with them, I do I do think that they deserve to have someone who's who's going to invest the time in doing right by them. Yeah. And if I know that I if I can already tell or I know because from past experience that I don't I, I don't really 
get, a, I, I won't get along with them or I, you know, I, we, our philosophies aren't the same or whatever. Um, I probably won't do a great job for them. Right. Because I, 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 I am going to, you know, just naturally, you're going to find yourself wanting to spend more time with the clients that you enjoy. Um, in the beginning, you don't have that luxury. You got to work with anybody and any, everybody you can get. Um, and work to the point that you can make that decision. Yeah. Get yourself to the point in your business where you do have the luxury of saying, you know what, I'm going to save myself the stress at this point because I want to be a good parent for my child when I get home. Right. And I'm not going to work with this person because I know they're going to be more stressed than they're worth. Right. Um, um, back to those dinners. I'm assuming that you're paying for most of those dinners if you're inviting them out or does it get to a point where it's more friendly and that's not always an expectation? Yeah, you know, we're hosting. Um, again, you know, you're, you're doing this, you're not doing this in the beginning of your career. You're right. doing this once you've built up a business and you're making pretty good money. Um, and you're doing it to the degree you can do it. Right. Um, you know, the, no shoe fits, no one size fits, fits all. So, you know, you, you can only do what you can do. Um, you know, fortunately for, for, for me at this point, I'm making enough money where, I, you know, I can set aside a certain amount of money during the course of a year for client functions, yeah, for sure. dinners or drinks or events or whatever. And then I write that stuff off. Um, you know, it's a good tax write off. So, you know, for me, it's, it kills a, two birds in one stone. The other thing I, I, I'll say just back to that quickly. And then I, I gotta, I gotta go because I have an appointment. Hey. Unfortunately, I need to cut this short. Um, there's also a really nice economies of scale that, that we've kind of stumbled across. I used to do personalized dinners for everyone. It's much more um, time effective and cost effective to do a dinner with t five or 10 clients at a time, for instance, or drinks with five or 10 clients at a time that maybe you think all of which would get together uh, or, 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 or get along together right. um, so that you don't have to go out 10 t different times and pay for yourself 10 different times for dinners with all those people. So that's been um, a really nice thing uh, to be able to do too. Try to get a bunch of people together at one time as opposed to doing one-offs with, with everyone. Right. Um, just different ideas. Okay. Well, perfect. Well, I know you said you have to go. So thank you. It's so, so nice to, to do this. Nice to kind of meet faces I, I, I haven't seen before. I wish you all, uh, wish you all luck um, on, on your journey. Feel free to, um, to, to seek me out if, if you have questions. Um, as you're getting into this or, um, you know, you get stuck on something, um, always here by phone or text or whatever, if you want to, uh, if you want to reach out. Awesome. Thank you so much, Josh. Yeah. This was awesome. Yeah. Right, Thank guys. you. I'm good to see you. Talk to you later, guys. Bye-bye.